Inflation, voting rights, abortion, climate change, gun violence. All issues the next Congress will have to face and questions the candidates in Ohio's 1st and 8th districts will have to face. As Local 12, along with the American Jewish Committee and the Jewish Community Relations Council, present the 2022 Congressional Forum. Now live from the School for the Creative and Performing Arts in Over the Rhine, here's tonight's moderator, Paula Todi. Good evening. Thank you for joining us at home and all of you here in this beautiful auditorium at the School for the Creative and Performing Arts. What we want to do right off the top is explain where is the 1st Congressional District and the 8th Congressional District in light of redistricting. So let's begin in the 1st District. The 1st District now includes all of the city of Cincinnati, eastern Hamilton County, part of northern Hamilton County, and all of Warren County. Now, a little bit about the candidates. Greg Landsman is a Democrat. He's 45 years old and is serving his second term on Cincinnati City Council. He holds degrees in economics and political science from Ohio University and a master's in theology from Harvard. He's worked as an aide to Ohio Governor Ted Strickland and as an executive director of the Strive Partnership, an education advocacy group. He and his wife, Sarah, and their two children live in Mount Washington. Republican Steve Shabbat is 69 years old. He's represented the first district in Congress for 26 of the last 28 years, where he serves on the Foreign Affairs and Judiciary Committees. He also served as chairman of the Small Business Committee. Prior to Congress, he served as a Cincinnati City Council member and a Ham Hamilton County Commissioner. He has an undergraduate degree from the College of William and Mary and a law degree from Northern Kentucky University. He and his wife, Donna, have two adult children and two grandchildren, and they live in Westwood. Please welcome Greg Landsman and Steve Shabbat. We now turn our attention to Ohio's 8th District. It now includes all of western Hamilton County outside Cincinnati City's limits, as well as Butler, Preble, Dark, and Miami counties. Now let's get to the candidates. Vanessa Enoch is a Democrat. She's 52 years old. She has an undergraduate degree in criminal justice from Ohio State, an MBA from Xavier, and a PhD from Union Institute. She's president and CEO of Cultural Impact and has also worked for many years as a college professor. She's never held elected office. She has two daughters and lives in Westchester. Republican Warren Davidson is 52. He's represented the 8th District since 2016 and serves on the Financial Services Committee. He's a graduate of West Point and spent 12 years in the Army. He's earned an MBA from Notre Dame and led his family's manufacturing business. He and his wife, Lisa, have two adult children, and they live in Troy. Please join me in welcoming Vanessa Enoch and Warren Davidson. Now here's the format agreed upon by all of the candidates. I'll ask a question directed toward one of the candidates. There'll be four minutes for a discussion with the time shared equally. It's my job to keep everybody on time. It is our hope this encourages more of an exchange of ideas. Again, this is a forum, not a debate. We're gonna go back and forth between the two races until the time runs out. Then each candidate is gonna have 30 seconds for a closing statement. The order of the closing statements and even the first question was determined by a coin toss before the broadcast. Before we begin, begin we want to point out that the AGC does not endorse or oppose political candidates. 
So now, our first question directed toward Mr. Landsman. Mr. Landsman, are you happy with the Biden administration's handling of inflation, particularly when it comes to pocketbook issues that affect so many in the tri-state, gas prices and food prices? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a really important one uh, for my wife and I. We have two young kids. You know, we're driving around to soccer games and, and uh, you know, swim practice and, and getting them to school. So we felt it, you know, the, uh, the price of gas, groceries, uh, it's been very frustrating. I, I will say that this economy has been broken for a very long time. Wages have been stagnant, and costs uh, continue to go up. Now, on city council, I have led the effort to roll back the property tax uh, five times. Uh, I led a bipartisan effort to make sure preschool was affordable for every single family in Cincinnati. Uh, unfortunately, and Congressman Shabbat has been in Washington for far too long. Uh, he's become part of the problem, and that's true in this case. Every attempt uh, to get wages up, he's voted against, and the same is true for costs. Uh, so whether it's health care or prescription drug costs, uh, just recently voted against lowering uh, the cost of insulin for seniors and children, uh, is just out of touch, and we need new leadership on this issue and so many others. Uh, he's just been there too long and it's time for change. Mr. Shabbat. Uh, thank you and thank you all for being here and thank Channel 12 for doing this, JCRC as well this evening. Um, yes, people are really hurting uh, because particularly the inflation that's hitting uh, middle income folks, especially uh, poorer folks in our community. And it was self-inflicted uh, by Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and uh, obviously uh, Joe Biden and these uh, policies which have caused, he said the economy has been tough for a long time. We had a great economy until the Democrats have been in the majority and all three of those entities I just mentioned and their policies have been destroying the economy in the country and prices are going up, hurting so many people. Um, and my opponent, uh, not only does he agree with all the tax and spend policies that have ruined this and caused this inflation, um, but he used to work for Nancy uh, Pelosi, so he agrees with her policies. And then when they talked about inflation, he said, what does it matter? What does it matter? I mean, it's hurting real people in, in this community. Uh, he bragged that he worked for her. And when he talks about lowering taxes, I'm not sure what the heck he's talking about. He voted to raise taxes eight times on city council. He said the property tax was too high and then voted to increase it even more. Uh, and he wanted the um, the uh, sales tax to be raised uh, as well. And this is all the time he's raising our taxes and wasn't paying his own taxes. So it's pretty incredible that he'd say this. And then finally, um, he had no problem with Nancy Pelosi's idea of hiring 87,000 new IRS agents to make our lives even more miserable. So I think these are all bad ideas. Yes, I've been there 26 years. I think I've been extremely effective for the community, delivered a lot of services, like to continue uh, to do that, and I want to thank all the folks for their support over the years. Thank you. Time for a brief rebuttal. Yeah, uh, that was a lot, um, and, and that's what, it's what happens when you've been in D.C. for as long as Congressman Shabbat has. Uh, you just sort of go through all the D.C. talking points, uh, and it's just not how we talk here. Uh, he's been so far removed from our lives, and it's a real shame. Uh, so, uh, look, people want the chaos to end. Uh, they don't want this back and forth. What they want are leaders who are going to say, look, I understand the wage issue, and I'm going to vote to get wages up. I'm going to push really hard to get wages up. I have to call up. time for the, the same first question. I need to respond to that if I, I can. It, um, relative format. to Washington talking points, him voting to raise taxes eight times is not uh, a Washington Actually, we, I have point. to call time. Uh, the first question now directed toward the 8th District. Your first question goes to Ms. Enoch, and it is, with regards to inflation, what should the Biden administration be doing that is not being done? So I think um, there are a number of things that can be done to deal with the issue of inflation. Um, one of the things that uh, has happened in, historically is um, issuing government bonds. That is one thing that, that can be done, um, as well as um, 
numerous other levers such as increasing supply. And I do think that the Biden administration has uh, begun doing some of that stuff. Um, many of the individuals who currently hold office are voting against some of those measures and then taking credit for them. Um, and, and that's a, a huge issue. But I do believe that uh, the Biden administration has started on the right track in terms of trying to increase supply. Um, so that's just one of the measures that can be done. Mr. Davison? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Joe, Biden, Joe Biden and his policies are just, they're bankrupting our country, they're fueling inflation, they're wrecking our economy. Fundamentally, he needs to learn from his mistakes. At this point, you know, he could have been naive and believed that some of these things would work, but we have the results. Uh, he canceled our energy policy that was working well, and, and prices started soaring. Uh, you created scarcity, and they explained it away as, oh, we're transitioning our economy to the Green New Deal. Uh, these policies aren't working for people in the 8th District. I've spent all August talking to people uh, here through Southwest Ohio, and they're being wrecked, whether it's gas or groceries, energy prices, uh, the cost of health care. All these policies are being fueled by too much government and too little freedom. Um, the, Joe Biden said that the emergency was over in his 60 Minutes interview, but he didn't follow through and cancel the emergency powers that are um, paying people not to work still. We should reinstitute work requirements and get people back to work. We still have fewer people working than we did prior to COVID. Um, and, and so yeah, 62, 62.5% are working. We had 63.5% working uh, before the before COVID pandemic. So they need to end the emergency powers and get people back to work. And then they need to stop spending more money. Frankly, his only solution so far is more government, which is more spending. And the, we're spending more money than anyone will even lend us. That's destroying the value of our money. And people are feeling it day in and day out throughout this economy. Rebuttal. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I think we should remind people about how the, uh, this crisis started in the first place. We are in the midst of and still facing the outcomes from a global pandemic, which means that the supply uh, shortages did not happen here in the United States. They weren't caused by any policy here in the United States, but instead by a global pandemic that no one could have seen coming, no one could have controlled. Um, and then uh, my opponent says that there are fewer people working since before the uh, COVID-19 crisis, forgetting the fact that over a million people died during this crisis, in addition to the fact that many people were sick and my opponent voted against uh, measures that would help uh, our economy, that would help improve people's health outcomes. And yet, we want to force people to go back to work. We have to do I have things. to call time. You have 20 seconds for a rebuttal? Yeah, it's progress to hear people not blame the other party and realize that, yeah, COVID was a pandemic. But, you know, a pandemic, you know there's a pandemic risk. We had government risk. We had political risk. Governments across the, the world uh, heavily limited freedom. They made people say, you're essential, you're not essential. Let's hope we don't repeat those same horrible mistakes. And Keep that families is from seeing their loved ones in nursing homes. We Thank can't you. repeat those mistakes. Our next question for Mr. Shabbat. Who do you blame for the violence on January 6th, and should the former president and others surrounding him be held accountable? That's a very good question. And the violence that took place, I've condemned it. I think it was absolutely outrageous. I think that those uh, that were responsible for the violence uh, should have been and are being prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Um, the so-called commission, uh, the committee that's investigating this, um, I think it was the right thing to do, but unfortunately Nancy Pelosi decided to politicize it by not only uh, picking the Democrats on the committee, but kicking off the Republicans that Republicans have picked. And if you know anything about how Congress works, both parties get to pick the people that they have on their committees. Nancy Pelosi decided only to have uh, two Republicans on there that she picked that were already uh, established that, that uh, they felt they had decided who was at fault. Um, it was an absolute outrage what happened there. I condemned it at the time, uh, continue to defend it. 
Uh, and I hope and pray that this never happens again. We're a heck of a lot better country than what we saw on that date. Mr. Landsman. Thank you. Uh, this is the first time that we get to hold Congress accountable for what happened on January 6th. The first time. That was a day that most of us will never, ever forget. And members of Congress knew after this violent attack what this angry mob wanted. They wanted what Trump wanted. They wanted for Congress to refuse to certify the election. Now, at the time, there were two members of Congress that were representing Cincinnati, Republican Brad Winstrup and Republican Steve Shabby. They both walked back into that chamber knowing full well what uh, these insurrectionists wanted, and Brad Winstrup did the right thing. He voted to certify the election and be part of the peaceful transfer of power. Congressman Shabbat turned his back on us and our democracy, refusing to certify the election. It's disqualifying. There are lots of issues that we're going to disagree about. This is disqualifying. It's one of the reasons why I'm running. He has been in Washington far too long. He's part of the problem, and we need change. For, there, it's time for. Thank you. For six years, I was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee's uh, Constitution uh, Subcommittee. And one thing I learned that you follow the Constitution in the United States, having led the committee, it's supposed to defend the Constitution. And the Constitution clearly says that the only people that can change election laws is the legislature of a state. What happened in Pennsylvania was a disgrace. You had some unelected officials, some elected officials that were not part of the state legislature that changed whether people had to sign uh, on the ballots, for example. Um, they uh, extended the voting, and, and I could not in good faith certify that what they did in Pennsylvania was okay. The other one was Arizona, and a lot of my Republican colleagues voted not to certify uh, Arizona. I felt that there were some irregularities there, but not like it was in Pennsylvania. I could not in good faith certify those electors, and that's why I voted the way I did. He has lost, thank you, he has lost his way, and it is too dangerous to send him back to Washington. We need change. Mr. Davison, this question is for you. The Center for Study of Hate and Extremism says that hate crimes are up double-digit percentage points in major American cities in the past two years. What is the government's role in responding? Well, you can't say it better than Jesus said it himself. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, the government can't make people do that. You know, our country uh, is built on uh, freedom, uh, including freedom of religion. Uh, so, but you can exercise your religion. And frankly, uh, I think the, the right way to do that and the way that I see most people here in Southwest Ohio doing it is you love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, can the government mandate that you do that? Well, we have laws, we have criminal laws, and we prosecute people who commit crimes. Uh, I am concerned that you see kind of more rhetoric that's meant to dehumanize other people. And I think we have to you know, call that out. You know, when you're dehumanizing others, uh, we saw recently just over the, you know, in my lifetime, I saw a lot of progress. You know, I, my grandparents were alive when people were, um, you know, practicing separate but equal and, uh, you know, de facto segregation. So in a lot of people's lifetimes, they've seen massive improvement uh, in, in all sorts of tolerance in our culture. But over the past decade or so, we've seen more uh, ways to divide uh, our country, and whether it's by race, gender, sex, uh, sexual orientation, uh, vaccination status, whether you wear a mask, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, urban, rural. Like, please just stop dividing our country. We're the world's land of opportunity. People act like they're embarrassed I love our country, I respect our flag, I support the police, you know, boys shouldn't play girl sports. These are things that shouldn't be partisan, uh, and they're not when I talk to people uh, across Southwest Ohio. Around the country, people have a hard time with that right now, and we're seeing a reversal. You're seeing campuses literally hold um, segregated graduations. You're seeing safe spaces where people from certain races or religions aren't allowed in the safe space, and I think we should be alarmed about that. Ms. Enoch? Thank you. Um, I, I think my opponent should first take a page out of his own playbook in terms of loving thy neighbor. Um, it, before the insurrection of January 6th, 
I warn that if leaders did not step up and speak out against the QAnon conspiracy theorists and some of the hatred that they were spewing, that we would implode from within. Just three months later, we saw an insurrection. My opponent refused to speak out against the hatred and, and the vitriol. And as a result of that, it fanned the flames of hatred for the leadership in this country to not stand, out, stand up against the hatred, but instead to vote to overturn a free and fair election. What you've done now is you've isolated half of the country and you've said to the country, to the nation, that our, our elections are not fair. Our elections um, don't represent the will of the people. When our country voted for the President of the United States, and so I, I would recommend that my opponent um, take a page out of his own playbook and love his neighbor as well. Mr. Davidson used his two minutes, so we are done with this question. So right now we are going to take a brief pause. The 2022 Congressional Forum continues right after this. Welcome back to the 2022 Congressional Forum sponsored by Local 12, the American Jewish Committee, and the Jewish Community Relations Council. Let's get back to the questions. The next question is for Mr. Landsman. What rights have the unborn? So this is also the first time that we've been in a position to hold our Congress accountable since a core fundamental freedom was taken from us. Uh, Congressman Shabbat has been in Washington for far too long. He's part of the problem. And it's on a whole host of issues, certainly this one. He has spent his entire career working to undermine this basic fundamental right. He has worked very hard to overturn Roe and to outlaw abortions and will do so in all circumstances, whether it's rape, incest, the well-being of the mother, doesn't matter. When I kicked off this campaign, my daughter was fully free. She's a 12-year-old. She is less free now because of folks like Congressman Shabbat. I will work very hard to restore this right and a whole host of other freedoms that folks like Congressman Shabbat and others are going to take away from us, whether it's access to contraception, IVF, marriage equality. Again, he has been in Washington for far too long. He is part of the problem, and we need change. Mr. Shabbat? Well, Mr. Lance, my opponent, is wrong on just about everything you just said about uh, me. We are a com compassionate uh, country. We can care about both the mother and the baby. And I am pro-life, always have been, always will be. Uh, and I proposed uh, the ban on partial birth abortion, which is a late-term abortion, which passed when all the way the U.S. Supreme Court became the law of the land. Most people agreed with it, even most Democrats uh, agreed uh, with that. We had exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother uh, in that particular legislation. And virtually all the Republican proposed bills always had those exceptions. So he's just wrong about uh, what he just said. Um, he's also wrong. He said before that it is, uh, it's too dangerous to send me back to Congress. You talk about if it's a danger, send Mr. Landsman up there. This is the guy that literally tried to defund the police here in Cincinnati. Take $200,000 out of their budget, $200,000 $200, out of their budget, and give that to the group that pursues, pursues complaints against the police department, and to take another million dollars out of money that was supposed to go to upgrade the police department. Now, Channel 5 did a report on this, and they said what he did was the definition of defunding the police. We ought to be supporting the police. That's one reason that the uh, local Cincinnati police have endorsed me, as well as the Warren County uh, police, and not him. Mr. Landsman? Yes, this is what Washington, D.C. politicians do. He doesn't want to talk about abortion. He doesn't want to talk about reproductive freedom. He wants to make up uh, a whole host of crazy things 
uh, about me and police, uh, I have a 100%, 100% track record on f uh, 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 supporting police and fire. Uh, there's time for a brief rebuttal. No, there's nothing yeah. crazy about what I said. What I said is, is the truth. He voted to defund the police, and on the life issue, he's completely misportrayed my view, which is protect both the mother and the unborn child. I, yes. I, again, he's just trying to distract away from this big issue. Uh, I have supported every police and fire budget. We've increased the police budget by $20 million. And this year alone, I led the effort for a second recruit class to increase our, increase our complement. That's the kind of leadership you'll get. Right. Next question is from Ms. Enoch. Is there legislation that could protect both a woman's health and the rights of the unborn? Absolutely. Um, First and foremost, to allow a doctor and a woman to make the decision about what a woman does with her own body. Um, we have an unalienable right to bodily autonomy. Um, that is not a right that was given to us by our government. That was a right that was given to us by God. And that is not something that our government can take away. Um, when we forget that the government is for the people, um, and not the other way around, then we have a government that overreaches. Um, I'm, I'm concerned when we talk about uh, outlawing all abortions. Um, there are three methods of abortion that are mentioned on the um, Louisiana State website. And two of them, interestingly enough, are two procedures that I had through a normal birth process. So now what you've done is you've now exposed a, a doctor who might induce a labor or perform a cesarean section. You've now caused that doctor to be concerned about going to jail if anything goes wrong in that birth procedure. And so I think allowing a woman and her doctor to make that decision free of fear of going to jail is the best thing that we can do for a mother and her baby. And the last place I want to see my congressperson is in my bedroom and in my doctor's office. And so I hope that... I, that not, claps at the end tonight, please. So I, I hope that we can um, make a decision to protect a woman's right to choose, her and her doctor, um, what she does with her body. Mr. Davidson? Uh, we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the intent of our Constitution. And thank goodness uh, Republicans worked together for 50 years to overturn Roe v. Wade. It shows the importance of teamwork to cooperate. We're able to save more baby lives today uh, than we've been in five decades. Um, what does that mean? It returns the authority to the legislatures instead of the courts. Uh, and so legislatures are, are going to legislate. In Ohio, we have a heartbeat bill. And the heartbeat bill uh, basically says that uh, you know, the woman can't use abortion as uh, birth control. Uh, fundamentally, you can use abortion uh, in the case Ohio doesn't ban uh, something that would cause, uh, chemically cause an abortion or a miscarriage uh, or prevent uh, you know, conception. So if you had a morning after pill or something like that, Ohio's law doesn't ban that. But Ohio's law says once you detect the fetal heartbeat, then you have to protect that baby's life. Uh, the, the extreme position in this are Democrats. Every single Democrat in Congress has rejected the Born Alive Survivors Protection Act. That's an infanticide bill. I mean, this is the baby's already been delivered. Uh, uh, you know, he's supposed to be kept comfortable while the doctor and mother have a discussion. Every single Democrat opposed that in the House of Representatives. It was such a sad day. Um, of course, they don't accept any other limitations on abortion. And, uh, you know, the, the law that ultimately overturned it in, in uh, Mississippi was 15 weeks. Uh, that's the norm in Europe. France, for example, has a 14-week ban. So I think we should see the return of safe, legal, and rare, and it should be extremely rare. There's time for a brief rebuttal. You know, the, this is the guy who, on Good Morning America, made the comment that he couldn't figure out how a 10 or 12 year old would not know they were pregnant before six weeks. That is tremendously concerning. These are the politicians that we're sending to Washington DC, way out of touch um, and have no earth, earthly idea of the nature of a 10 or 12 year old, much less a 10 or 12 year old rape or incest victim. 
And that is concerning, deeply concerning that for is me. That is time for that question. Thank you. I turn now to Mr. Shadow. Uh, it's, it's, it, well, it's, it's, it's four minutes total. It's still so false. if one person talks a full two, then we can't go back. But you can use it in a closing statement. Mr. Shabbat, explain your vote against the American Rescue Plan, and specifically as it gave direct funds for hiring and training law enforcement. Yeah, the American Rescue Plan, what they called it uh, prior to that was the COVID relief bill. And the COVID relief bill contained 9% that had anything to do with COVID relief. It was chock full of all kinds of leftist agenda stuff, Green New Deal stuff, uh, you name it. And then they did throw some police money in so that anybody who voted the responsible way, because the Democrats knew they were in trouble, because they had essentially thought it was okay, or the riots that were going on out in the streets. On the judiciary, the Democrats, what they did, um, their answer to the riots that we had going on in cities, especially in Portland and Seattle and other cities, we had them right here in Cincinnati as well, their answer was to do away with qualified immunity. What's that? Well, right now, if a police officer, uh, they can't be personally sued as long as they follow the procedures that they've been taught in, in the police academy, which is reasonable. What the Democrats wanted to do is take that away so that they could be pursued, they could be sued personally. What does that mean? Well, it means your kids' college education funds, the equity in your home, um, your, your savings, virtually anything could be sued and lawyers could go, who wants, wants to be a police off, an officer under their circumstances? That's why if you saw the front page of the Enquirer just a couple of days ago, this police recruit class that he's bragging about, they couldn't get enough people that wanted to be police officers that were qualified. We've got to stand with our police so that we have safe neighborhoods here in Cincinnati, especially in the city, but throughout the, the community. And they put that bill in and then they attacked all the Republicans who voted against this multi-trillion dollar uh, giveaway. And that's what caused inflation, that plus they're discouraging energy production here. We saw 8%, 9% inflation, the highest in 40 years. That's what Pelosi and Schumer and Biden and Landsman, if he gets up there, that's what they're for. Hold that on to your pocketbooks if this guy gets there. Your, your and applause later, please. Mr. Landsman. Yeah, thank you. You have to be somebody who's been in Washington for decades to uh, say, I didn't vote for a bill that included $350 billion for police and fire because of this and because of that and all this other stuff. You either voted for it or you didn't. In this case, he voted against $350 billion in police and fire, which is why, among other reasons, he's trying to say, oh, I don't support police and fire. Here are the facts. Uh, I've been on city council for five years. I voted for every single police and fire budget, every raise, uh, $20 million increase uh, over the last five years, the most ever. And we did uh, fund a second police recruit class because we had the money from the American Recovery Plan. Thank goodness his efforts failed. Same with the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Thank goodness his efforts failed. Otherwise, we wouldn't have money for the Brent Spence Bridge or the Western Hills Viaduct or paving our roads or retaining wall. Thank God his vote failed on January 6th or we, would, we wouldn't have our democracy. He's been there too long. Uh, we need change. No offers, please. All right. Um, no we, time for a rebuttal. That question is finished. Yeah, can, we move on. You can save it for closing statements. I'm sorry, it's four minutes shared. Uh, Mr. Davidson, since 2016, the number of children killed in school shootings has jumped tremendously. In 2016, 52 died. Last year, it was 118. This year, we're on a cataclysmic course. What more can be done to protect children? Look, it's just incredibly tragic what we're seeing at our schools uh, and it's senseless violence. It, it is absolutely abhorrent to watch uh, what happened in Uvalde, in particular when the first responders who were there didn't respond. They didn't rush into the building. And you, you, you know that people are wired differently when they are the ones that run to the fight. Uh, but you also know they're wired differently when they stand aside and know what's going on and they don't take action. I, I, I know that we have to have a thorough investigation of that. Thank goodness that's an outlier. Here in Ohio, we had um, first responders uh, in, in Madison 
uh, right as I got elected, that came in and uh, chased down a school shooter, and we stopped it before it could get worse because they had a good school, school resource officer. Um, in Ohio, we've got the flexibility to be able to arm staff uh, and train them so that they can respond so that you don't have to wait for law enforcement. And that not, might not be as big a deal in an urban school district where they're well-resourced and have school resource officers, but in rural districts where there's, they're more scarce or the response time for reinforcements is longer, that's a big deal. And so uh, I think when you look at the school board, fundamentally the first question they have to ask is, is our school safe? And when you look at school choice, uh, parents should be able to choose to take the money and move it with their kids to what school works for them, whether that's academic, safety, whole so host of other re reasons that we should be able to do that. But that's m fundamentally a state policy. At the federal level, we've provided more resources for school safety, more resources for mental health, and we've done a more thorough job of, uh, of making sure that we can vet, uh, vet shooters, uh, potential shooters. And so uh, I, I think we're doing a lot of the right things, but fundamentally you have to look at the local, local level and first and foremost, make sure your school is a safe place. Ms. Enoch. <laughs> I'm, I'm weirded out just simply because this guy wants teachers to protect children, teachers after 24 hours of training to protect children against the people who he allowed to have assault rifles to, that could go into schools and kill children and, and his approach is to arm the teacher. There are bills that have been introduced that could help deal with this issue of violence against children. He voted against that bill. He voted against the bill to protect women, violence against women, to protect women against gun violence. He voted against that bill. He has no interest in protecting women or children. And he is dangerous to have in Congress because he believes that a, a teacher with less than 24 hours of training should be our defense for our children in schools. That's, that's just astounding to me. Mr. Davison had his two minutes, so we're going to move on to Mr. No Landsman. Got it. Um, Mr. Landsman, a recent Supreme Court decision allowed for a football coach to continue leading students in prayer on the football field after games. Religious minorities feared that only Christian prayer was upheld. So do you think it will apply to other religions, for instance, could we have Muslim prayer on the football field? Yeah, thank you. This is a question about separation of church and state, and it's an important one. Um, I have a master's in theological studies, as you mentioned. I, uh, ran the governor's office of faith-based and community initiatives for many years. Uh, faith is a huge part of my life. And when faith-based organizations and government work together, uh, they are able to do amazing things. Uh, feeding folks, mentoring, uh, getting folks better paying jobs. But it's very important for government and politicians to keep their religious views out of public policy. And this is a big difference between Congressman Shabbat and myself. Uh, I know that my views are my views, uh, but we can't have this ongoing uh, uh, issue where politicians take their narrow-minded uh, views and impose them on all of us, uh, which is what they're doing when they're trying to take uh, away reproductive freedom. Uh, and the same is true for a whole host of issues. This is what Congressman Shabbat has been doing for decades, decades in Washington. And it's one of the many, many reasons why we need change. Mr. Shabbat. It's hard when you get an answer like that, which direction to go. It's just so convoluted. Um, you know, he likes to say that I've been in Washington too long, but then he does uh, a fantastic job of just repeating the Democratic D.C. talking points attacking me. I mean, it's incredible what this guy's uh, have been doing here. Um, it's a serious topic, the separation of church and state. Um, it's an important principle. And having, as I mentioned before, chaired the Constitution Subcommittee of Judiciary for six years, and my ranking member was none other than Jerry Nadler, who is the chairman of that committee now. And Jerry and I worked together on a whole lot of things, like the Voting Rights Act 
which was critical to get that passed in a bipartisan uh, manner and signed into law. But the free exercise of religion uh, and making sure that the government uh, does not implement a state religion. That's essentially what it says in the Constitution, and we follow that. And these are decisions really not for Congress, is my naive opponent thinks Congress is the one making these decisions. This is for the courts to decide. They're the referees on cases. They make the determinations on these things as they should. Um, it's one of the reasons that federal judges and the Supreme Court judges are appointed for life, so they can keep the politics out to the degree possible, although unfortunately, <laughs> politics always interjects itself uh, in, into these things. Um, but very important question. Uh, I appreciate you giving us both the, op op the uh, option to, uh, uh, the, uh, the, in order to answer this question, because it, it's very, is very important. Uh, we have time for about 15 seconds. Yeah, this is a very important role for Congress. We need a member of Congress who's going to restore our freedoms. We need a member of Congress who's going to restore our freedoms. That's why we need change. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Enoch, does more need to be done to ensure religious minorities have as much say as Christians? I, I definitely believe that um, all people should have the right to a free and fair government. Um, without regard to their religious belief. I am a member of the clergy, and one of the things that I have made it my life's business to do is to respect difference, respect people no matter where they're from, no matter what their beliefs are. And so I don't um, intend on legislating my religious belief. Um, what I intend to do is to make sure that all people are treated fairly are uh, able to practice whatever their religious beliefs are. Um, that's what our Constitution affords us, and that's what I believe, just from a personal standpoint, that we, we have to do. Mr. Davidson. Yeah, so the question is, should we do more to protect religious minorities? And uh, I think we, it's hard to improve upon the First Amendment. The First Amendment, the first clause of it is that the United States, no government can establish a religion. So uh, our country was diverse. The Puritans were distinct from the Quakers in Maryland. The Catholics were distinct from the, uh, you know, the Anglicans in, that were heavily present in, in Virginia. And the Founding Fathers didn't want any of that. Early on, Roger Williams founded Rhode Island as a place for religious tolerance because he was banned from preaching uh, because he wasn't licensed uh, by the Puritans. So he was a Baptist and he went to Rhode Island, set it up. That's where the first Jewish synagogue in America was, uh, and those principles were enshrined with the non-establishment clause, but they were also protected in the free exercise clause. So you don't have to be in the religious majority to exercise your faith, and fundamentally a faith that does not influence your beliefs and values, uh, most people reject that. They want a faith that's actually going to change everything about you, the whole person, and uh, you know, to the extent it doesn't, you know, you're still able to practice it, you're still able to call it faith. Uh, but our Constitution protects it, and uh, I think it'd be hard to improve upon it. We should always defend it, and it's under attack. Do you wish to rebut? I, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, all right, um, we're going to move on to Mr. Shabbat. Are you satisfied with the Biden administration's response to Ukraine? To Ukraine? Mm -hmm. um, they could do better. Um, however, I do agree that we need to make sure that Putin doesn't prevail in this. Um, the real problem with the Biden administration uh, was this was originated, I believe, in the debacle of a pullout from Afghanistan, which sent a message out of weakness to the world's worst actors, one of those uh, being Putin. I think that was one of the things that, uh, that he used in his decision process that probably uh, the United States wouldn't act or would act weakly. Uh, or we couldn't get our European allies to work with us. The other thing that's probably even more dangerous is President Xi and the PRC, the People's Republic of China, whether or not they decide to go in militarily against Taiwan. And I happen to be the co-chair of the Congressional Taiwan Caucus. That would probably, if they did that, actually end up uh, with a military confrontation between the United States and China, which we absolutely do not want to see. So we need to continue to support, and I have supported the Biden administration in continuing uh, the funding uh, to make sure that Putin does not prevail. And the, the Ukrainians have been inspirational in, in their success thus far, and we ought to continue to support them, in my opinion. Mr. Landsman. Yeah, we absolutely have to 
provide Ukraine with all that they need to beat back Putin. Um, and I believe that's happened. I, I don't believe that Congressman Chabot has supported all of the funding. If I'm wrong, I apologize. I don't think that's true. Uh, we need somebody who's going to be there and support all of the things that they need. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to get a Congress in, in Washington uh, that can tackle these issues and others uh, because you've got folks who are willing to work together, who are, uh, you know, not grandstanding or fighting, bickering. I mean, all of the, you know, chaos in D.C. has become so problematic on so many levels. And Congressman Chabot has been there for decades. And he is, you know, part of the problem. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I ran and uh, why we need change. I believe we have a little time. Yeah, I think uh, we acknowledge that I've been in Congress for a while, okay? I, I can see that. Great, great. But the problem is, one of the reasons that I've been able to stay there is because that I actually work with Democrats. Um, University of Virginia and Vanderbilt, thank you. They've done a study and of who are the most effective members of Congress. They've done it three times in the last 10 years, and I've come in in the top 10 members of Congress. And there's 435 of us in being effective. And you're more effective if you work with both Republicans and Democrats. So that's why I do it. All right. oh, oh. Mr. Lanz, I, I, know, I know we all like to emote, but Mr. Landsman, when it's cutting in your time, you have time. Uh, only somebody who's spent, uh, you know, decades in D.C. <laughs> Would, would, would say, hey, there's this institute at a college who says I'm bipartisan. You voted against a bipartisan effort to certify an election. You voted against a bipartisan uh, effort to invest in our infrastructure. You voted against a bipartisan uh, effort to fund police and fire. There's nothing bipartisan about you. You don't know what you're talking okay. about. Okay, we are, we're moving on to a question on Ukraine for Mr. Davidson. If Russia responds with nuclear weapons, what should the United States do? And do you think Putin is bluffing? Well, Putin certainly wasn't bluffing when he said he would invade Ukraine. And we should take him very seriously. He's an evil man. Uh, it was an unjust invasion. Uh, fundamentally, the problem is the whole world knows Joe Biden's weak. And weakness invites aggression. Uh, we've seen countries take advantage of Joe Biden, which means they're taking advantage of the United States of America. Um, it would be tragic uh, and a horrific miscalculation if Vladimir Putin used nuclear weapons uh, anywhere in the world, uh, including in Ukraine. So I think the United States would have no choice but to respond. But let's be clear, this war is not America's war to fight. The American people are funding this war. We're funding it two to one to the rest of the world. Uh, Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo told Europe that quit cozying up to Europe, quit cozying up uh, Europeans, especially Germany, quit cozying up to Vladimir Putin in Russia. You're making yourself dependent on Russian energy and you're underfunding your NATO obligations. And sure enough, what did they do? They kept getting closer to Russia, more dependent upon Russia, uh, and they made themselves vulnerable. NATO still isn't meeting their treaty obligations and we should be doing more as a country to make sure that the United States doesn't get the whole tab here, that NATO is actually stronger, less dependent upon Russian energy, and fully funding their national security obligations. Ms. Enoch. So first and foremost, I'm sure that my opponent was not considered one of the most effective in Washington, D.C., the way uh, Mr. Shabbat says he was. Um, in fact, my opponent voted against providing arms and funding uh, to um, Ukraine. Um, in fact, most of his votes have been for uh, strengthening Russian forces. So I think we have to um, take that into consideration when we consider who we're sending to Washington, D.C. Um, he voted against um, Finland and Sweden joining NATO. You know, those are things that would strengthen the U.S. position and our allies' position in Ukraine. We have to be concerned about the rising threat out of Russia. We have to be willing to stand and do what we can so that Russia doesn't continue to spread its influence. And thank God 
the Ukrainians are, are reclaiming their land and, and because of those individuals in Congress who voted to give them the, the arms and the funding that they needed to fight this war. Mr. Davidson? We have a president who's more concerned about Ukraine's borders than America's borders. We need to secure our borders. And fundamentally, the resolutions to support NATO were not to support NATO. They were resolutions of support for a, a new strategic purpose for NATO. NATO doesn't need a new strategic purpose. It's a defensive alliance, uh, and until NATO's attacked, they should be focused on defending themselves, and they're not. So if we want to grow it, we should hold them accountable for honoring their treaty obligations. We know Joe Biden's not going to do that, uh, and so we should withhold funding until he will or he appoints leaders who will do the same. You have 10 or 15 seconds for a rebuttal? I have nothing else to say. <laughs> We're going to do briefly a little something different here, a quick lightning round, 30 seconds. We've touched on this earlier, some of you. Uh, a lightning round, with Americans so divided, we feel divided, but the numbers actually bear that out. The Vanderbilt Unity Index says we're the most divided we've been in decades. So let's start with Mr. Landon, 30 seconds. How do we unify? Yeah, so as a local elected official, I don't feel uh, what I think we see in D.C., right? So, you know, we get everything done in a bipartisan way. We have to. And, you know, whether it is, you know, working on making preschool more affordable or uh, ensuring that we're investing in public transit and our infrastructure, investing in police and fire, all of these core services, we're all working together. And so I think when people have common it's time, purpose, Mr. Chabot. They get along. I represented a very diverse district for a long time, many years, as my opponent will remind you. Um, and I've been successful and been found to be one of the most effective members of Congress because even though I'm a conservative Republican, I work with Democrats. Um, Ami Vera, who happens to be the chairman of the Asia and Pacific Subcommittee of Foreign Affairs, I'm the ranking member, the lead Republican. We work together. Nydia Velasquez from New York, she was the chairman of the Small Business Committee. I was the ranking member. I was her it chairman. Is time. We work Thank together. You. you get things done when the parties work um, together. Now it is your chance, Ms. Enoch. Um, I think we can start by listening to one another. Um, my opponent believes that he only represents 30% of the population in his district, and so the rest of the uh, individuals in the district um, find themselves reaching out to other people for help with the things that they need. Um, I have people calling me all the time. I reached out to my legislator, couldn't get any help there. Can you help me with this? I'm not in Congress yet. It is time. Mr. Davidson. Yeah, I think it's important that people turn off, uh, turn off the TV, they back away from some of the social media. Social media doesn't really tolerate nuance very much. And just go outside, see your friends and neighbors, talk to them. And when you're outside talking to your friends and neighbors throughout Southwest Ohio, they love our country, they want e pluribus unum out of many one, and they know that America is the most welcoming place in the world. We admit over a million people legally and it is every time. year, and we and should I, celebrate it. I'm cutting you off, but I'm going back to you because given the coin, coin toss, we're now going to our closing statements. And it starts with you. You have 30 seconds for closing statements. I want to thank you all for hosting this event and for the people that took time to tune in. Uh, being an informed voter is incredibly important, but make sure you vote. We came off an election where there's still tens of millions of people who question the outcome. Prior to the 2020 election, 62% of Republicans and 63% of Democrats questioned whether they would be able to trust the outcome of the election. Uh, there are a lot of things that I, when I'm out talking to people, they still are concerned, is my vote really going to count? In Ohio, we've made real, uh, real important improvements in our election laws, and we've made it e easy to vote and, it is and hard to cheat. And is I humbly Enoch, ask for your vote. Your closing statement. Again, my name is Vanessa Enoch, and I hope you'll visit my website at enochforcongress.com. I want to go to Washington, D.C. and fight for you. Not for big business, big corporations, special interest groups, and all of those things that my opponent already fights for. I'm going to Congress to be a voice for the people. I have no other agenda in Washington, D.C., but to be your voice. So I hope you will go and to enochforcongress.com. Thank you, Ms. Enoch. And now we turn to Mr. Shabbat, your closing statement. Thank you. My opponent likes to attack me for having been in Washington uh, for a long time. I put that experience to work for the people right here in the greater Cincinnati uh, area. For example, during the pandemic, as the lead Republican on the House Small Business Committee, 
Uh, I was instrumental in passing the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program. We got more money and most importantly saved more jobs than any other congressional district in Ohio. Mr. Landsman would just be a rubber stamp for Nancy Pelosi's tax and spend agenda. Mr. Landsman, your statement. This is the first time we've been able to hold Congress accountable since January 6th, since a core freedom was taken away from us, since Uvalde and dozens of children have been gunned down here in Cincinnati. He has been in Washington too long. We need change. I'm a father, a former teacher, somebody who led the effort to make sure preschool was more affordable for thousands and thousands of families. I'll go to Congress to protect our democracy, restore freedoms, and keep our children safe. Uh, and if that you're, is time. Thank, thank you. you. I want to thank the candidates for participating tonight. It goes by so quickly. Ohio voters have until the 11th, one week from tomorrow, to register to vote. We'll have election night covered for you on the 8th. Thank you all for coming. Please go vote. Good night, everyone.